This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. And welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 19, Episode 10, recorded and released on December 18th, 2011, that's a Sunday, live from a very holly jolly Pacific Northwest, my name is Chris. And my name is Alan. Hey there, Alan, welcome back to the big show. Hey. Now, uh, coming up on the show this week, we're going to cover uh, the mistakes we've made and the corrections you've sent, and also uh, some follow-ups to a few stories and things like that, and, and also some suggestions from you folks out there. It's our Feedback and Errata episode, and that'll be in the second half of the show. And then up front in the uh, top of the show, it's our picks, and then the news segment, and there's some pretty interesting news, including mm -hmm. some new games for Linux that we're going to talk about. I think people will be excited and interested in. So uh, it should be a good show. And then uh, also at the end of the show, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, next season. I think what we, what we have coming up in the pipe uh, for, ep for season 20 of the Linux Action Show, if you can believe yes. that. We'll be, crossing, uh, we'll be crossing the 200 episode mark at the end of next season, too, which is yep. really exciting. So um, here we go. Now, before we get into all of that, though, I do have my Linux pick this week. This is a great runs Linux. Check this out. The Impromptu Lamp runs Linux. And this was uh, submitted over on the Linux Action Show subreddit, and it comes from Hackaday, and they have hooked up <laughs> this is, it's like <laughs> one of those like little uh, mini, tiny uh, uh, Linux motherboards that have like all your basic you know, hardware you need to run a Linux operating system. Mm -hmm. And then they've hooked them up to this light board, and they control this light board just like any standard hardware interface in Linux, and then they've put coffee cups over them, and they've actually ended up making kind of a cool light decoration system that's powered by Linux. And they can even yep. go into the Linux software and through a web browser and tweak the colors and all kinds of stuff on right. demand. Like, I don't know, like it's they a, say, it's, it's internet enabled, so you can go online <laughs> and change the color of the light. Yes, it's so geeky. I love that. I love yep. that. So that, that was the runs Linux for this week. I have a runs Linux that I'm trying to track down, too. I, I try to make sure I can really verify that when somebody says something runs Linux, it, it honestly does, because that'd be kind of embarrassing yep. to claim something mm -hmm. runs Linux and it doesn't. In the uh, Linux Action Show subreddit, somebody submitted that the International Space Station runs Linux, and they claimed they saw it booting up on a video tour of the International Space Station. Now, I have not been able to track that video down. If anybody out there has a link to that video and wants to submit it to the uh, links, or no, sorry, that's the wrong one, uh, linuxactionshow.reddit.com, mm -hmm. uh, then I would dig that up. I'd love to make that a future runs Linux pick, so... Uh, if anybody knows where that's at, that'd be awesome. Now, I have got a free uh, g a game that was paid that just went free for Android, and nice. it's going to be a great holiday time killer. And I've also got a new uh, desktop app that's, that's launched, or an update to a desktop app that's launched. But before we do that, I want to say good morning to the fine folks over at GoDaddy.com and Danica Patrick. Ah, yes. Of course, right? Mm -hmm. Now, everybody knows GoDaddy. World's number one domain name registrar, huge supporters yep. of the show, huge supporters of Jupiter Broadcasting. Um, now, but let's talk seriously. Why would you want? Why would you want to use GoDaddy? I'll tell you why I use GoDaddy, Alan. Maybe you can mention why you use GoDaddy. Oh, but yes. for me, for me personally, before GoDaddy came around, I used a lot of different registrars. In fact, uh, we used the wrong registrar. We picked the wrong registrar for JupiterBroadcasting.com. I will just yep. straight up admit that. And now we are really in a situation where we're in a bind. And mm -hmm. when you deal with a one-off registrar like that who doesn't have systems in place to manage this and doesn't have the facilities and tools that they give you as the customer, like GoDaddy does, where you can do account delegation, you can do account transfer, domain transfer between accounts and all this stuff that empowers you to avoid these exact kind of situations, that's why I like GoDaddy. Because they're an in industry standard, because they're a heavyweight, and because they're going to give you guys a deal. And actually, they'll give you a deal on a couple of different things. Depends on how, what you want to do. So let me tell you about your different options here, folks. Um, if, uh, you, if you're watching this before the end of the year, before December 31st, you can take advantage of free private registration. And, and there's no limit on how many... Uh, so if you want to buy like five domains at a time, you get five free private registrations, which is yep. a $10 a year value. So that's really awesome. Uh, that's just for each the, domain, so you're saving 50 bucks. Yeah, yeah. It, and, and honestly, um, I, don't think I, would sign up, but I don't think I would sign up for a domain without private registration. Right. As we talked about on TechSnap, it can be really important to, yeah. to, to yeah, have so, that uh, privacy. <clears throat> just, you know, 
just it's just worth doing. So use the code Linux17 when you do that to get that private registration for free. Also, though, if you want to get some hosting for incredibly cheap, this also mm-hmm. ends at the end of December, so you have to take advantage of this soon. Use the code Linux11, $1.99 hosting for three months. $1.99 hosting. And also just use our standard codes Linux to save 10% when you check out and Linux20 to save 20% on GoDaddy's excellent fourth generation hosting. So uh, mm-hmm. thanks to GoDaddy for their support of the big show. Now, Alan, how about... Uh, well, because I've, uh, I've had problems with registrars other than GoDaddy as well. Uh, when I used to use uh, speedy domain name registrar.com, uh, I couldn't add my own name servers. So when I was trying to set up... Uh, to delegate the control of my domain to my .ca domains, sure. there was no interface, and I had to email them and wait like a number of days for yep. them to do it. Yep, yep. It's because mm-hmm. they didn't have an interface. And then, uh, you know, years later, they eventually just went out of business one day, and trying to get my domains back was a nightmare. You know, it was yeah. And <laughs> since then, I, I I was like, everything's going to go, Daddy, and it's just going to stay there because that's a place you know, I can sick. trust not yeah. to. Yep. It's like putting your money in a bank you know is going to stay around. Yeah. Um, now, I've got an app pick that I want to see if I can tempt you with. I don't know. If, are you much of an Uno player at the card game? Uh, wasn't really, but it's something we always do at Christmas time. Exactly. And I think Uno has totally uh, nailed that because uh, they've just made Uno free in the Android market. And uh, it's a great little card game. I don't know mm-hmm. if I would have paid for it, but now that the free actual legitimate you know, uh, actual version because there was actually a couple of ripoffs of Uno in here is right. now free. This is totally the way they go. Plus, it has uh, Wi-Fi multiplayer support, so you can be in the same oh. room or over the over the net. And you know, this is you don't have to bust out the cards, you don't have to make a mess. And you can just sit there in family because pretty much, come on, doesn't everybody in your family now have a smartphone, or at least yeah. some other people in your family have a smartphone? Pretty so much. if you're doing the holiday thing, this is probably a great little toy to have at the holiday thing. Yes. Plus, everybody in the family always wants to know, oh, what apps are you using these days? What do you got? And you can be like, well, I just got Uno. It's free. Mm-hmm. So uh, link to that in the uh, Linux Action Show show notes. Now, the uh, Blender Project has a new nice. release this week, so I'm making this the universal app pick. We haven't... I, I, I went over Maggio's list that Maggio keeps. You can find a link to the, all of our previous picks in the show notes. Mm-hmm. I went over Maggio's list. We've never picked Blender before. So then I thought, okay, well, now we've got to wait to pick Blender until you know, there's a real good, re- solid reason now that we, <laughs> we've slagged on this. And yep. well, now we have it. Uh, Blender 2.6.1 is out. And uh, Blender is just a 3D modeling tool that can be sort of made into do almost anything, including even just straight up linear vid- video editing. Um, but check out one of some of the new things they've added in this release of Blender. They now have GPU acceleration and uh, for, for their like yeah for like their textures and stuff like that. They have motion tracking now. So if you're trying to do something kind of clever and you want like I don't know somebody's head to stay over somebody else's head in a video, and you the thing that motion tracking lets you do is you set sort of like key points and then the software figures it out. So you don't have to go frame by frame by frame to do something. So this is extremely and a very, very important feature they've added. Uh, They've got a few other things in here. I'll I'll include a link, including one that I like a lot called uh, they've improved. Now, they've kind of had this before, but they've improved their Python API. API. So I think Mm -hmm. you're going to start seeing a lot of third-party plugins that are going to work with Blender, even more than we already have. But the other thing they're doing is they're doing an add-on that lets you export a project to Adobe After Effects oh, and some other tools, too. Mm. And this is something where open source shines. You're not going to see a commercial product of this quality that will let let you export out to their competition. Whereas open source, there's no financial loss for them to do that. There's no right. disincentive, so why not? And it means that you can start something in Blender, and if you need something that does... Uh, so After Effects is, is just better at certain things. And if you need something mm-hmm. that After Effects does, you can get 90% there in Blender and then move it over to After Effects, which is awesome. It, it, makes, yep. it makes the whole production pipeline much more doable under Linux. Um, and uh, to this extent, I actually just released uh, the second part of the behind-the-scenes tour of the Jupiter Broadcasting Studio mm-hmm. over uh, the new In-Depth Look episode. And I actually touch a little bit on why I use After Effects over some of the other software packages. And uh, also, uh, you just get a tour of my recording setup in my office, where you get to see my Linux Mint laptop, that's the soundboard for SciByte and all that cool. kind of stuff. So that's over Jupiter Broadcasting too. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, uh, you can find yeah. a link to that. But yeah, it's open source is basically the opposite of vendor lock-in. And, yeah, exactly. You know, every vendor product is basically trying to lock you in, mm-hmm. and so having the ability to to get in and out of those. Uh, you know, walled gardens or whatever you want to call them is is very powerful. It is, it, and as an as a like, person who can, you know, their their income and their their job 
is dependent on tools like this, mm-hmm. that kind of flexibility is is not something that you know you can't just it's not just a bullet point that goes on a box i mean it fundamentally changes how you use a product it's great it's right. awesome let's well, so imagine where we'd be with video on the internet if there wasn't the ffmpeg project that would allow you to convert basically anything to anything well you wouldn't have youtube you wouldn't have you know yep, archive.org exactly. wouldn't yeah it, it wouldn't be able, yeah it's it's an they're awesome project so yeah there you have it blender and it's the new uh the new release 2.61 also kind of neat that the blender project is doing is they have a uh, bi-monthly release schedule and they have this great little progress bar that goes across the calendar so you can see their next planned release uh, 262 is going to be in february of 2012 that's kind of neat to be able to see the progress like that i like how they do that all right alan well i think that's all the stuff we have for all our picks for the top of the show let's do the news all right alan the top (laughs) story on the news docket for this week uh kind of got my feathers a little ruffled um, yeah, and uh, but you know we'll we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll move past it here. I'll I'll tell you folks what it is. Uh, it's been announced this week that uh, that Sony's uh, that there was a lawsuit brought against Sony that for removing the option to install Linux on the PlayStation Three. That uh, lawsuit took a pretty major blow in February when the when the judge uh, trimmed it way down and, and dropped a bunch of stuff and said, all right, well you can go after this this one angle of your case, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, and that uh, that didn't end up working for them. This, uh, um, unfortunately, they were trying to go after Sony for unfair and deceptive business practices and uh, claiming breach of contract or unjust enrichment, yeah. but uh, it just didn't stick. And the plaintiffs, according to the judge, um, just didn't really make their case. The plaintiffs were allowed time to amend the suit, but after that, uh, Judge Seaborg uh, approved Sony's motion to dismiss it. He ruled mm-hmm. that they just couldn't prove any right to expect other OS support beyond the warranty period. And uh, if you know, uh, or even continued access to the PlayStation Network, he did go on to say, as a matter of providing customer satisfaction and building loyalty, it may have been questionable. Um, as right. a legal matter, however, plaintiffs have failed to um, align the facts or articulate the theory on which Sony may be held liable. Uh, in other news, the judge said, "Well, Sony's had a real bad year, so I didn't want to kick him in the nuts at the end of the year." No, <laughs> um, you know, screw Sony. I, I I put a video out on YouTube a couple years ago about installing Linux on the PS3, and uh, it's gotten you know like 200,000 views. People love it. Yeah. They want to be able to do that, and the you know the reason they the reason why they took it off. Uh, it never was quite clear, but it sounds like they figured out people could jailbreak their PlayStation 3s and, you know, then to go after the PlayStation Network. Well, they banned Linux, and then that's exactly what they had happen. I mean, yeah, the series of events is undeniable. And so here we are at the end of the year. And, and you know, there were the instances where people would buy, like, 100 PlayStations and make a computing cluster out of it. And with Sony losing money on every PlayStation, that's, but it wasn't big enough to justify taking away that. Yeah, 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 I, I agree. It's a shame. Um, and, you yeah. know, it, the, for standard straight-up uses, it was actually it actually ran Linux like inside a VM, and it, the performance wasn't that great, at least when I tried right. it. But if you knew how to get around that, you could actually get a pretty rockin' box, yeah. especially with uh, some of those uh, compute projects. That but were. honestly, I think part of it is the fact that, we, like, if there's a case about financial crimes, then they get a judge that understands the concepts of yeah. financial crimes. yeah. yeah. Right, they have like a special court for it or whatever, but for IT related stuff, they don't. And even even when you explain it to the judge in in fairly explicit details, sometimes they just they the without having a background in how the stuff works, they'll never yeah. truly understand it all. And isn't that a big problem we're seeing with the SOPA stuff too? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, well, that's more lawmakers being. Yeah, totally but it's the same right. thing. People who don't yeah. understand understand it, trying to make judgments on it, yeah. and it's yeah. it's it doesn't make any sense. Do you think um, it's gotten better, say, over the last twenty years? Do you think people uh, are becoming bit, more like, savvy? You know, we saw with uh, the Kevin Mitnick stuff where the the prosecution was able to say that if he whistled into a payphone, right. he could launch nuclear missiles. Right. And the judge believed that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the judges are, uh, you know, they're a regular internet user, maybe. They know how to use their internet browser. They don't understand how DNS works or, yeah. or in this case, why you would want to install some other OS on your PlayStation. Right. They don't understand the value. Yeah. Right. I, I completely agree. Let's talk about something that uh, you might find pretty valuable, Alan, because you are mm-hmm. a KDE guy. The chat room's yeah. already been talking about that this morning. By the way, do you guys know we... 
We stream this show live on Sunday mornings at, oh yeah, I tell, that, I tell you that in the intro, at 11 a.m., no, 10 a.m. Mm-hmm. Pacific over at jblive.tv. The chat room said, Chris, you, you are going to talk about, uh, about this uh, KDE story, right? Now, here it is, folks. Uh, Plasma Active 2 is out. Now, some of you eagle-eyed memory uh, viewers out there might remember that uh, we had uh, someone on, was it Aaron? So we had someone on from the KDE project a while back, and he was demonstrating uh, Plasma Active 1 on a, on a prototype tablet the mm-hmm. next release is out and this is this is the kde's project uh this is their go at making a usable tablet interface and this is yeah. really exciting um mm. so they call and it plasma active. If, yeah and they they spent a lot of work taking feedback from plasma active one yeah. not just what people actually said but they were collecting usage statistics on how people actually use the buttons and so on so and applying it they check, yeah, they've even built some of that into the into the actual software. I'll touch on that. Uh, they say uh, Plasma Active is aimed to be more than just an application launcher. When users turn on the tablet, instead of a traditional grid of applications, they see activities showing their current project, task, or idea. The activities focus lets you collect all of the documents, people, websites, media, and widgets related to a topic in one place and building a personalized and interactive view of your life. Now, that's a little hyperbole there at the end, but I do like the idea of taking, like, I'm going to take my tablet and I'm going to research the next episode of Linux Action Show and I'm just going to consolidate everything into this activity. And when I go here, everything about my, my work for this episode is contained in this one collection of stuff. Right. That's compelling. I, I like right. that. Rather idea. than having uh, one screen of icons for your internet apps and one screen yeah. for your social stuff. Or one folder have, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then you have, you know, the social stuff and the people, the contacts, and the uh, applications, and the websites for the Linux Action Show one bundle, and then in some other bundle, you have the ones for TechSnap or whatever. And it's, it's so instead of categorizing things, it's grouping them by logical relationships. Right, right. And this is, now you kind of touched on, you said, that, you know, they looked at feedback and they're working it in to make the project better. The project itself, this Plasma, Plasma Active 2, I, I guess I'm kinda, I kind of want a better name than that because it's kind of a mouthful for them to, yeah. for something on a tablet. But uh, this is neat. This says, <coughs> excuse me, it says, uh, there is a new recommendation feature which uses the semantic desktop technology to let Plasma Active learn as you use your device and then me- make recommendations as to additional content, websites, and applications that may be an interest given to what you're working on at the moment. And they include a screenshot of like, uh, hey, here's a recommendation of something you might like. Now, I really like this if it could tie in with an app store because how, how great would it be if you're working on a project and the tablet could go, you know... What you're trying to do, there, we have an app that might actually do this better for you. Would you like to go get that app? Yep. That would be really cool. Or even just, you know, other things you already have on your phone, but it, it's like this is related. We think this is related to this project you're working on, the Linux Action Show. Do you want to add this RSS feed into this group or whatever? Right? It doesn't have to be about selling you something. It could be something that's already on your phone. It's just saying, True. would you like to group these things? You already have this data. Why not take yeah. advantage of it? Yeah, I like that. Uh, one last thing on Plasma Active 2. Uh, Plasma Active 2 will run on a much wider variety of devices than its predecessor did. And mm-hmm. uh, both Intel and ARM, te- uh, ARM architectures, which is great. And also, uh, they have a specific example of the XOPC, the BeagleBoard, the Arcos G9 tablet, and mm-hmm. uh, other NVIDIA Tegra 2 devices, which is a pretty big category of stuff. So awesome, yeah. awesome stuff. Great to see this because you know how I feel. I mean, Web OS, now that WebOS is going to be open sourced, I feel a little better. But I hate just to have yeah. one Android. You know, I hate to just have Android be the dominant tablet platform eventually. Yeah. And and you know maybe you know WebOS is there as an underdog, but you know we need a little bit of variety. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And 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 also it keeps the iPad from stealing dominance. Anything we can yeah. do to kind of introduce other ideas and get people thinking about other ways to approach things than just the way Apple does it, which is what I love yeah. about this is clearly a departure from just the standard Apple template, which is great. Right. Um, exactly. Because, you know, just because it was the way it was done first or the way it was done by a certain person yeah. that's no longer around uh, doesn't mean it's, it's the best way to do it. Right. Exactly. Uh, now, I feel like we talk about these all the time, and to be honest with you, I don't mind. I think it's great, nope, but we have another great. Humble Indie Bundle that's been announced, the Humble Indie yep. Bundle 4, and this time it's, it's sort of your standard affair. They've got a few great games. One that I, I bought the whole bundle just because of this one game, so I'll, I'll mention that in a minute, but we've got to talk about the cool stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. So first of all, uh, for a little while, we didn't make it by the time we were shooting this episode, but a big supporter of the Linux Action Show was uh, in spot number four, which is awesome. Uh, yep. But, you know, people have been paying more, so they've dropped off the list, which is great. That's a, that's a great reason to have it fall off the list. Um, mm-hmm. 
Love it like you always see it, though. Average purchase price of the Humble Indie Bundle, number four, has been $5.31. On average, Windows users, $4.74. On average, for the Mac users, $7.38. Linux users, $10.20. Yep. Way to go there, Linux users. So always awesome. Now, I did mention there was a game that I love. I don't, I don't know if you got a chance to look at the bundle, but... Uh, not the newest one, no. Oh, okay, okay. It's almost worth it entirely for Gratuitous Space Battles. That's actually the name of the game. Mm-hmm. Gratuitous Space Battles. And if you just feel like, you know me, I'm a fan of Star Trek Online. And sometimes, oh, yeah. though, I just want a, just a quick, ridiculously great space battle. And yep. uh, this, is, that, this fits that bill perfectly. And one of the great things about the Humble Bundle is games that weren't previously available for Linux are now available for Linux if they want to be part of this bundle, which ah, is awesome. awesome. So you yes. got to check this out. I, you know what? I gave him 50. I'm a, I am broke as hell, and I gave him 50 bucks because mm-hmm. I, you, can, you also, you know, they, they send the proceeds to a charity, or you can have them just send it to the, to the, to the developers. Yep. Um, I, I love the way they do this. I, I do fear a little bit of maybe community... Um, uh, maybe they might be wearing the welcome a little bit. Yeah. Do you think do you get that sense that maybe... Um, not necessarily. It's, you know... As long as they keep an interesting game in there that you want to buy every time, then people will keep buying it, right? That's the key, I think. Yeah, I mean, I do. And I, I'm just glad to see this stealing some of the thunder from Steam. Steam was, you know, always having these sales on old games. And yeah, yeah. they were, you know, it's like, oh, it's only $5. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, with the Humble Indie Bundle, you're supporting indie developers rather than mm-hmm. established developers selling their back catalog. And charity, if you want. And you're supporting yeah. the development for games on Linux, which is awesome. And yes, and that's exactly what it's all about, is... Yeah. is is getting this crop cross platform happening. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And, you know, is- if we see more like we saw with the last bundle where Introversion gave away the source code for their yes. games as well. That now, really that win. was you know, it wasn't a great license, but it's still the source code so that people can they're they're basically saying this game is gonna become abandoned now. Uh, and rather than actually see that, we're like, here's the source code, go make some mods. That's awesome when games do that. That is yeah. that is great. Now I, I cannot believe anybody's actually been able to wait this long to play Blu-ray discs under Linux. Um, my hat's off to you. Mm-hmm. Good news, though. Uh, this information came out from the VLC project, a uh, story over on Phronix.com. We have the first release of an open-source Blu- pl- Blu-ray library. Now, this is not the entire solution, but let me, let me give you the story here. This is going to be yep. called Lib Blu-ray, being uh, championed by the VLC project. I believe it's going to be released under the GPL2. Nice. And uh, the Video Land is already adding the library to their next version. Mm-hmm. So this is quite seriously, you're now going to have the ability to play back Blu-ray under Linux with one exception. You also have to have the Lib AACS library. This, this library doesn't do the decryption. It, does, it handles all the playback stuff, and like it'll do menu navigations and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't decrypt. Right. There's, and there's a, separate, there's a separate library that does decrypt, but you actually have to supply it the key. You have to give it... Now, that's probably not too hard to probably come across, right. really. But um, right. huge, and, though, right? Adding you know, Blu-ray Part of this to, is really the fact that they want to make sure that they don't get sued, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so they include support for Blu-ray and say, you have to decrypt it. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like the other library is over here, and you have to, you have to actively mm-hmm. get that. Though, if they can come up with a way to... to to make it work, or maybe like Fluendo or a company like Fluendo could sell the key or something like that, then a mm-hmm. uh, huge, huge boost for Linux yep. media centers, for XBMC, yep. for all that stuff. Because honestly, I still have my PlayStation 3 hooked up primarily just to play Blu-rays it's, at this point. Exactly. Yeah. And, so, you know, at, at this point, I think they're still uh, at the point of, of brute forcing the keys for the Blu-rays uh, or something to that effect. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, an online index of you look up the movie you want and here's the key and you plug it in and you're good to go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I'm sure it'll happen, but... Yeah. VLC. Man, I love VLC. All right. I yes. mentioned it before when we did our apps that we're thankful for. What are you for. thankful for? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. The, the next story you threw in the news docket and, and uh, I'm excited about this. We have uh, a viewer in the JBLive.TV chat room who uh, has already rooted and replaced the ROM on his Kindle Fire, but this... This sounds like the easiest jailbreak I've ever heard of. Uh, this guy jailbroke his Kindle Fire with just an MP3 no, file. No, sorry, a Kindle Touch. Oh, Kindle Touch. It's not, not even fire. the Fire. So it's the it's like the ninety nine dollar one. Yeah. So you could replace. You could make it. You could basically turn it to a ninety nine dollar tablet. Uh, well, sorry, I think the Touch is one thirty nine. But yeah. Well, either way, that's now you're getting pretty competitive yeah. with the Nook. Now, I'm now, still more of a Nook guy. I like what Barnes yes. and Noble's doing with Microsoft and all that stuff. But yeah. this is compelling. 
and it's funny the way they did it, Alan, was they just put like uh, like the executable code in like the comment section of the ID3 tag of the MP3 file. Right. So basically, it means that the Kindle is subject to a, a script injection. Yeah. Uh, basically, their whole menu interface is HTML5. And so when it prints the ID3 tag for the song in the interface, it executes a bunch of JavaScript. Uh, Funny, huh? And that JavaScript, in this case, adds some options to the menu so that you can jailbreak your phone or your uh, tablet. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, the end result, so I guess, it's, is... Uh, you know, technically, it's a big gaping security hole, but in this case, it's very useful. <laughs> The end result is he got SSH access to it, and uh, he says he's going to try to work on you know, getting it more functional because it's missing big pieces that it needs to be a full Android tablet. Like Right, but now once people get SSH access, they can, yeah. they can develop yeah. it. And with it being just HTML5, you know, there's no SDK, there's no... I wonder if he used like Jailhouse Rock as the MP3 or something like that, you know, to break <laughs> out of that. Uh, I... I think it's great. You, you, you know, you know. Here on the show, we're we're such huge proponents of jailbreaking and rooting your own device. It's not even funny. Yep. Uh, you know, just give you just to tell you why. Uh, this last week on my Evo 4G that I kind of have sitting around as my experimental Android phone because I upgraded the Nexus S, and uh, I I thought you know what, screw it. I'm just going to put Ice Cream Sandwich on here, and I went yep. and got a ROM using the ROM manager, and within 20 minutes I was running Ice Cream Sandwich. I thought you know right, this is great. It's a little hokey. It's not quite ready yet. And I just went back into uh, my uh, my uh, little recovery area, and I just reflashed my older gingerbread install. And with another five ten minutes, I'm back to what the way my phone was before I tried ice cream sandwich. Mm -hmm. You know, to be able to swap out your operating system like that, play with the new stuff, go immediately back, and don't lose any traction. Um, that's only something you can do when you truly own your device and you root it. So it's yep. pretty compelling, and it's you get to play with extra stuff like that. So uh, that's uh, that's cool. That's the uh, link uh, link for that one. If you guys want to see that in the show notes, if you have a Kindle and you're curious about jailbreaking it. Now let's talk about some uh, moves that Oracle has made that's forcing Canonical to uh, pull the uh, Java the Java runtime that's in their partner archive from their server. Mm -hmm. They're actually going to be pushing out a blank package to force when people do updates to force uninstallation of the uh, of the, yeah. of the uh, Java runtime from Oracle. Now this isn't as bad as it sounds. They're going to be disabling the, the Sun JD, JDK plugin, but the reason primarily is, is because Oracle is trying to move the community over to the uh, the new Open JD, JDK um, yeah. runtime and, and all of and also the development work uh, runtime too, and uh, so it's kind of funny the way Canonical is going about it is a little heavy-handed. What they're having to do is there's a there is a security vulnerability in the version that's in the Ubuntu repos in the uh, Sun Java. Uh, uh, right. JDK and uh, Oracle is not going to update it anymore. So what a canonical solution for Ubuntu users is, and this is important. If you use Sun JDK on your Ubuntu machine, you need to pay attention to this. They're going to be pushing out an update to uninstall it, essentially. And yeah. then you have so to go either go get it from Sun's website or go get the Open JDK uh, runtime that's in the main Ubuntu repo. Yeah. So uh, that's probably the way to go it's, because going forward, you know, the new the new official Oracle ones are going to be based off the open one too. So. Right. It, it, it seems a little. Oracle being rude, but mm, yeah, not letting people know, be. They revoked about the it. license and they uh, said you can't have our our JDK anymore. You have to use the open one. Yeah, and and I agree so. with the chat room. I have no problem with open JDK. I, what my what my problem is is uh, Oracle's kind of like, hey, you know, all those years that you helped ship our products to make us uh, to have us, you know, have a wider install base so we can get more adoption, so we earn higher revenues. Uh, thanks so that, for doing that. You know, Go screw yourself. Yeah, so so that we can brag in our installer that we're on three million or three billion devices. It's like, sure, and now you're going to get uninstalled because... Yeah, we're done with you now. Yeah. We're done. Thanks thanks for all the fish. So long. Yeah, right. Oracle... I'm not a fan of Oracle. <laughs> I know, and I, I try not to be a hater, uh, but I have never... I really, I really just wish they hadn't bought Sun or, or MySQL. <laughs> right, right. And I, I, I have tried to not be one of those people that just assumes they're a bunch of jerks, but I'll tell you, man, every interaction I've ever had with Oracle, every story I see about them doesn't put them in a good light. I have met representatives that are trying to push unbreakable Linux at Linux Fest Northwest. Mm -hmm. They are they are they are always standoffish. They wouldn't they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't talk to us on camera. They totally disrespect the platform when they're there talking about it. They pretend like they pretend like unbreakable Linux is their own creation and not just like a and not know, just Red Hat. <laughs> repackaged Red Hat. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about a software update though. We got another update coming. Um, the GIMP project, GIMP 2.7.4 is out. And uh, yes. if you're a GIMP fan, the reason I think you might be interested in this is if you have wanted some pretty good Wacom tablet support, so you could do some uh, drawing. Because I know we have a, 
we have a few people in the audience who do that kind of work. Uh, they've added a lot of yep. support for, for the Wacom tablets. And also, kind of interesting, they're starting to take their first pass on making GIMP touch accessible. They're trying to think of how uh, GIMP needs to be kind of re UI'd to make it work on tablets. Are you really going to do that? Well, I guess you'd want some graphics capability on your tablet at some point. Yeah. Well, especially if the tablet has a camera, it could be very useful. Uh, but same time, hmm. you know. Hmm. That's an interesting touch, point. The touch interface is like the opposite of the Wacom tablet, right? Yeah. Well, actually, kind of like, so if you had GIMP on your tablet, you could take a picture and then open up GIMP and actually adjust the picture. That's kind of cool. Who would really do yeah, that? But that is of course. Cool. When you're doing photo editing, it's like I, I use the adjustable sensitivity setting on my mouse to, to yeah. get down there so I can pick individual pixels. Right. I can't do that with my fat finger. No, no. No, it's definitely going to be a more limited sort Actually, of Actually, I have like. kind of scrawny fingers. Yeah, and it's still difficult. Still not good enough. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, we'll see where it goes. I think they're just taking a first couple pass. I guess I would say it like this. I would love to see them do enough so that if I had a tablet, I could use it. But right. I don't want it. I don't want them to go all Unity GNOME three on it and just right, make and it. And I don't want them to to take away from developing other features to make it more competitive with Photoshop in order to do touch. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We'll see where it goes. I think it's just they're just getting started, and you know, I wouldn't worry about it too much at this point. Yeah. Uh, one last thing I want to point, or no, two more things we want to point you to, but one's kind of a uh, watch on your own and maybe read the comments. I have yep. a link in the show notes to a great discussion thread on the Linux Action Show subreddit about an interview that Richard Stallman had over on Russia Today, the, uh, yep. the uh, Russian state television station. And he was on there sort of explaining the differences between free software and, and proprietary software that's also free, you know, Gradius, yep. as he calls it. Um, and it's, other than the sort of rather annoying interviewer who obviously doesn't get what Richard's talking about, it's kind of an interesting interview, and it gives you a great... Right, um, well, in part of it is that, you know, Russia has specifically stated that they kind of are leery about using all Microsoft stuff because they can't tell what's actually happening there, and it is technically an American company. Sure, and sure. It's a, a foreign government that's not necessarily hostile, but isn't, you know, exactly friendly either. And uh, so, you know, they were talking about giving, they give funding to the ReactOS project, I think, but, uh, hmm. you know, they're also mm -hmm. considering, you know, if, if they go open source, then they're, there's a lot more security. And they know that the app isn't stealing data and sending it to a oh, government. They're not, that, they're not in that vendor lock-in situation like we were talking about exactly earlier in the too. show. Yeah. Which is important when the vendors are in another country. Uh, so, good interview and also great discussion in the uh, Reddit. So, I'll link to the Reddit, which then links to this video. It's about 30 minutes if you want to watch it. And uh, Cool. Kind of cool. It, if nothing else, it's cool to see um, Russian television interested in those topics. You know, you wouldn't see yeah. Richard Stallman on Larry King or something like that. Hopefully someday. <laughs> well, maybe. Well, I don't. not Larry King. I don't think he's doing it anymore. But, uh, right. But all right, so one more kind of story on the news docket, and this is a great one. And, Alan, I'll let you take it since you uh, threw it in here. But uh, yeah. the city of Munich is ahead of their uh, Linux deployment, which... Yeah, well, sounds good. They were behind and then they were ahead. But yeah, right. Okay, so they so this they started is the people that were way behind, right? Yeah, so they started in two thousand three with the goal of they had Windows NT four and they didn't want to upgrade to Windows XP and still be locked into Microsoft. I actually, I think that was the big show around back then. I remember covering the story when it broke. I think. I think so. Yeah, um, and so they got behind because they ran into a bunch of problems, but they reorganized and. Uh, so now the city of Munich has managed to convert 9,000 uh, computers to awesome. their, uh, their custom Linux distro. Uh, now, they have 12,000 to 15,000 computers that they need to finish doing it on, which seems a lot for a city. Well, I guess it's a state more, but still, it seems like a lot yeah. of computers, honestly. Yeah, yeah it does, uh, doesn't it? But uh, they're in the process of replacing everything. Uh, now, the problem they had before is they had like 27 different basically uh, operation centers and they had no common file servers no common directory oh services goodness. it was all just every different area had their own setup yeah they've even come and out and said we were just naive we didn't we didn't appreciate the well, complexities well, they, of it they were naive when they decided they could just convert everything to linux they they weren't expecting as much resistance from some of the departments as they got right Cause, or you know, microsoft some, i mean microsoft came in and you know tried to make yeah, a big case of it, it too it, yeah uh, and you know they admitted that it's it costs a little bit more uh, to do as part of the changeover because they're doing all this extra work, but once it's done, there's no recurring license fee, and even right. though you know that's only saving a couple million dollars a year, they're not that worried about it. It's more that they have the ability from now on to 
not be vendor locked in. Yeah, they said we don't want to. They they even call it this. They say we don't. We want to stop being a happy slave. Yeah, we don't want to be a slave to one vendor. Uh, yeah, boy, what a theme for today's episode, huh? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so you know they replaced Microsoft Office with Open Office, uh, but they also used uh, this custom template thing they did so that uh, they could replace a lot of their um, VB scripts that were part mm -hmm. of their mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft's Office mm -hmm. thing. And they said that was one of the biggest things is because OpenOffice doesn't really have something identical to it. Right. And, you know, people that wrote it, they had to find ways around these issues. So they, yeah. they like they said, they were naive in, in not considering the number of, like, the thousand little hiccups that are, are going to come with switching over to free software. But... You know, moving away from IE to Firefox and moving to Open Office and a bunch of things like that are definitely going to make it more productive in the long run. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, and the, one of the things is they're supporting the open document format rather than good. And you know, as that was an important goal because, again, you don't want to be locked in on the vendor. And they said they, they in the interview they talk about how some people were. Uh, dependent on ActiveX and all kinds of... That's a great yep. read. So links in the show notes. And congrats to them. I mean, they've almost hit 10,000 machines. That's a big deal. Yep. So that's it really is. cool. Yeah. All right, Alan. Yeah. Now that's all the news mm -hmm. for this week. And it's time for the Linux Action Show Feedback and Errata. Yes, it's true. We'll actually admit every now and then we get a few things wrong. Now, what yep. we're kind of planning to do is uh, the last episode of a season will be the Feedback and Errata. We've already had one this season because I was experimenting with the, with the format, and now I've decided the, the I think unless we have uh, something big come up, the 10th episode of every season will probably be where we cover a lot of the stuff. Tell yep. you what we got wrong, tell you what we need to uh, update you on, things like that. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll start now. I, I, I started a few different threads, so we'll kind of go through those. As uh, as we uh, get rolling here, but the first one, because it was my bad, I think it was just like last week, um, I talked about the uh, Linux um, Linux Foundation's job reports. Do you remember that? Yep. And and yep. what it, that was my bad because uh, it actually the way the way I phrased it made it sound like it was sort of applied worldwide and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and I after re I re went back and reread the story and it wasn't really all that um, representative of pretty much anything in, right. in the Linux job market. And you know what had happened is that it came across my radar earlier in the week. I read the story, threw it in the news the news docket, figuring, well, it's just an infograph. I don't really need to reread this again. And uh, well, there you go, yeah. lesson learned. So right, uh, and I would so it was statistics from one's particular job listing site or the job listings on Linux.com yeah. or something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, I kind of mentioned that when when. Canada was underrepresented is like that mm -hmm. was just it, it's not a representative sample and it depends also on the job right because yep. one other thing they were talking about is as far as skills that we're looking for is like half of all the jobs are for sysadmins but the yeah. top five skills they mentioned were not sysadmin skills right yeah yeah it's it was like, pretty weird so I, I regret putting that in the show but um, yeah. well I'm no it's, it was still useful to know what what for them, skills yeah. are popular well and what it is is uh I I I am always watching the Linux job market. A, you know, because yeah. I, it's, I come from there, and B, because I know a lot of people watching come from there. And if I can do anything to help people find a job, oh man, I'm all yeah. about that. And that's that was really the impetus to why I threw that in the news docket, and it was just it didn't really work out that well. Um, so I'm reading through. The, I think it was still uh, useful though. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm reading through the uh, the subreddit here, and uh, one thing that uh, was a couple of people have mentioned, which I'm pleased to see, that uh, just in general feedback for season 19 is uh, they liked that we had a few extra people come in and, and chat with us about different subjects. You know, yep. I was looking over what we covered in Season 19, and we started in Episode uh, 1 was uh, the Ubuntu and Kubuntu review, and then we had our Feedback and Errata episode, which is kind of the test for this one. And then uh, Season 19, Episode 3, we did the Arch Made Easy, and then uh, Is Desktop Linux Dead? We finally kicked around that sort of elephant in the room topic in uh, Episode 4. We had a Fedora 16 review this season, also the OpenSUSE 12.1 review, which was fun. And uh, then we did our Thankful for Open Source episode on, on epi yep. uh, Season 19, Episode 7, right around on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then we just got done with the uh, Linux, 12, Mint, Linux Mint 12 review on, uh, in Episode 8. And then last week was the Sound Card Troubleshooting episode. So um, mm -hmm. pretty, uh, pretty active season. I, I, really, uh, I really thought we covered a lot of ground. Some mm -hmm. things people had comments on, though, about the ground we covered is uh, we got a lot of people saying they really, really, really liked the focus on distribution reviews. And then a bunch of people saying that they kind of got bored. <laughs> yeah, they we're getting sick of them. And you know what? That those you'll notice. I think that just depends on the time of year, right? Because yep. there's a time of year where about twice a year, a lot of distros come out, and yeah. then we go distro heavy. And then there's 
periods of time where there's no distress. So that's just kind of the natural ebb and flow of, of the yeah. Linux uh, uh, ecosystem. Maybe, maybe we can uh, try to avoid doing two distro reviews back to back. We could, you know, the thing is, is they're timely, right? You want to right, get them yeah. released when, when the distro when, releases. That way exactly. people are searching for them, people want to know, and they're trying to make their mind up. But yeah, yeah, we did go through a stretch where it was kind of back-to-back -back for a little yeah. while. The other thing that uh, kind of dovetails with that is we got a pretty, pretty much split down the middle. People were saying this season was a little too technical, uh, uh, specifically the open-source software that we're thankful for. Uh, yeah, episode. we were kind of... We picked what the stuff we use, and we're kind of sysadmins more yeah. than desktop users. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then at the same time, we got just about as many comments saying the show is not technical enough, and they'd like to see things like Gen 2 reviews and like the inner workings of, of the kernel and, and, and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think that means we're kind of hitting a, a middle balance there, and that's a good thing, I think. Yeah. But we're still looking for feedback on that, you guys. So if yeah. you want the and show to noob it up a bit, we can. And specifically, if you could tell us specific topics rather than just general stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's well, like how the kernel works is kind of a broad topic. If you have a specific question or something, then it's much easier for us to do a segment on that than on something completely Right, know, something where it's a little more ambiguous. Negative. Yeah, yeah, ambiguous. That's a great way to put it. Now, uh, we might as well mention this now, since it's kind of like what you want to see, is uh, early next season, we're going to do a Linux Action Show Help Desk episode where uh, you send in your like Help Desk type problems. They can be real beginner stuff like, you know, uh, video card issues and 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 just real stuff like just you know you surprised it's this hard and you just need help with or it can be higher end more uh, back end stuff that uh, is mm -hmm. is more technical i've started a thread over on the uh, linuxactionshow.reddit.com um subreddit and there's you just drop in your question there the linux action show help desk thread and i went, i went, i made sure that uh, when i typed show i capitalized both the s and the h that way it looks ugly i wanted to make sure i got that so yep. uh, nobody worry, I managed to screw that up for you. But you go there, and I'll put a link in the show notes, and uh, submit your help desk question in a, in a early season 20 episode. We'll, we'll cover those. Um, so yeah, I yeah, was going to mention so that, that, that next was, segment. That was uh, somebody's uh, suggestion in the feedback thread, and so we're going to do that. But in order to do a help desk episode, we need people to ask for help. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, give us as much detail as you can so that we can uh, provide some good uh, feedback. But now, also... Uh, Oh, go, uh, go to the go to the the uh, feedback thre or the uh, help desk thread and vote up questions that you would like to know the answer to as well. Right, that is I, you know what. Thank you for mentioning that. I, we we do want people to vote on the comments in there so we know which ones other people might also be experiencing. So we'll yeah. the ones that are the most highest voted comments will be the ones we probably go with. So yeah, good yeah. point out. Um, now there was an interesting suggestion that came from Jason John Wells in the uh, in the Reddit page. He said, "How about comparing three apps that do just about the same thing, like a showdown between video players? Uh, maybe mm -hmm. even voting from the audience. You could like you could throw a poll in the live chat room or something like that. That'd be kind of cool. And then uh, we'll kind of crowdsource these different apps. I love that idea because it happens pretty frequently where there's oh, especially like Linux has this thing where it, there's so much fragmentation, right? There's like 12 media players or whatever. Right. So if if we can uh, have people suggest and and pick the top 3 and then we do a little showdown between them. And yeah. again, if you guys can help us by, you know, listing your favorite feature or your least favorite feature or uh uh problems you have with one specific player where it doesn't work doing this or whatever, yeah. then we can then we can actually have a little showdown. Chat room, the chat room likes the uh, showdown option or idea as well. So yeah, let's do that. And uh, I will we'll throw we'll throw a poll in the uh, in the live chat, and then also we'll throw it in the show notes after we do it, so then people watching and downloading can vote, and then we'll always cover it later. That could be it. That'll be a neat that'll be a neat addition to the show. So uh, yeah. thanks to Jason John Wells for suggesting that one. Now, and that one fits in with people wanting us to cover more uh, media center type stuff. So starting with media players seems like a, a logical place to start. Great idea, sir. Now, uh, one more bit of uh, feedback from uh, Metal Freak, who is a great contributor over on the... Oh, so is Jason John Wells. All these guys are great contributors. But uh, yep. he says, in Episode 7, Chris said that DuckDuckGo is open source, and it's not. DuckDuckGo is built on open source, but DuckDuckGo is mostly closed source. However, a growing portion of it is becoming open source, and they have uh, he supplies uh, quotes and information and links to that. And right. you know what? I think uh, that was just me having lazy mouth when I said yeah. that, because... I, I know that it's not open source, but what I think I, I think on their site they pimp that they run on top of open source or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah, well, so does it. everybody. That's true, though, right? It's it's like, true, I but I, I like well, I like their open sourcing portions of their code more and more. Yes, uh, but you know they still have their secret sauce, and that makes sense. But yeah. you know, 
Now, here is something I want to know if it's confusing for people because Apollo 7 wrote in. He said, I would like to see a fact on the website that covers options on how to download the show. Like, you know, downloading with a save as, right clicking, using the website player, streaming it, the live audio, the JB Live TV. Um, and I'd also like to know how to watch it on the Roku or in a VLC player. And uh, he also wanted to know, is there any premium uh, perks for being a monthly uh, subscriber to Jupiter Broadcasting's, uh, on, on, you know, you can you can opt to donate um, like two two to ten bucks per month. So let's start with the first part of his question. So the first part of his question was is uh, a fact on how to download the uh, different episodes and things like that. Now, um, is that needed? Do people are people are, is, is the site kind of confusing on how to download stuff? Because I'd be willing to do that if people yeah. think uh, if if you need it. Um, but hey, imagine they'll make a forum post. <laughs> we have uh, we do have a lot of different options. You know, you can watch just about every episode on YouTube. You could watch it from our site using the streaming player. I'm still struggling on and off with HTML5 video playback, but I'm, I'm working on it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's the RSS feeds, which is really the best way to get the show automatically is just subscribe yep. to the RSS feeds. Um, and there's yeah. a separate feed for each show for each format. Mm -hmm. And uh, it should be in January be adding an HD feed for, uh, for the Linux Action Show, because right now you can only download an HD. There's not an actual RSS feed for the HD version. And the reason was is when we created the Linux Action Show, it was audio only, and then when we started doing video, it was like no one would ever be able to download the show in HD. So I never made the feed. And now, of course, that, that has changed. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, let's go through here, and uh, the uh, help desk suggestion we've already touched on. We're going to do a help desk episode. So let's do that. Here's one from uh, Nathan Gnu, and this is a question that he got wrong, but I think other people might be confused about this too. He says, JB needs to switch to an appropriate Creative Commons license and should download the uh, YouTube WebM version for each show and then upload it uh, for us. You know what? Actually, that is exactly what I'm thinking about doing. I haven't, I'm going to take a look at their quality, but after a long time, YouTube will convert every version of a video you post to WebM. So I'm wondering if I could then later on go back and grab that WebM version and then rehost it. But the problem is, is I don't really have a place to host it at. So there, there's there's right. that, but uh, he touched on the uh, we need to go under a Creative Commons license thing. All of JB's content is under uh, Creative Commons with uh, share alike and attribution. So uh, if you can take it and do anything you like, you just have to attribute to us and uh, not re-license it under something more restrictive. So that right. all the all the shows, everything we put out, all our music that we at least own um, is under Creative Commons. So yeah, so maybe we should make a little. Uh jupiterbroadcasting.com slash license page with that and, and stick it at the bottom of every show note or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that might not be bad. I do flag it like on um, the back end, like hosting platforms and stuff like that, but it doesn't really get it's not right, really visible. Right, this way it. Yeah, people can users. find it more easily. So uh, that was that was probably the most I wanted to get yeah, out of now, Reddit. Was there the any question about like playback in VLC, there's, yeah. there's a... Oh, yeah. Un under the live stream, there's a, a, a VLC playlist now. So you just click that, open that with VLC, and it it fires it up with all the right settings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's the RTSP link, uh, which is the same as the VLC one, except for it's just the link, not a playlist. So it doesn't have the buffering settings. So you can get stuttering and so on if you don't configure your player yourself. And then there's the iPhone one, which is the iPhone one technically is HTML5. So if your browser is compiled to do H.264 video, that will work in your browser. Of course, Firefox and Chrome by default don't support H.264, so that won't but it works in Safari, and uh, I don't know if Opera does or not, uh, but it's HTML5 live stream if uh, you have support for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, the uh, other feedback is people people really enjoyed having Matt on the show, and uh, they thought mm -hmm. he had some good tips, so I think we'll bring Matt back in early January and, and cover some more tips with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, people also... Uh, suggested that we cover more news. They thought that um, one of the threads I saw in the Google Plus comment thread was that uh, they didn't think we talked enough news in the show, that the, the news coverage is one of their favorite parts. Yeah. And uh, that's nice. We'd to like to, but uh, you send us more news then. Yeah, <laughs> that is what it is. Uh, the news cycle is, especially in December, it just really mm -hmm. slows down. Uh, last episode, you know, was like 30 minutes long. Partially because the what, the way I normally the no, the way I normally format a show is you take the news and whatever is important you whittle it down to the important news that people are going to care about and then you then take this then we have the B block and we you know have the main show content there or whatever the you know the, the main the overall arching, arcing concept for the show is that episode. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's just not a lot of news and we have shorter thing to cover in that segment, we're just going to have a shorter show. I I'm not really a big believer in just stretching things out to just stretch them out. Right. You know, having like annoying conversation about unimportant stories that nobody really cares about. I'm just, I'm more, because we're not, 
because we're not a traditional broadcast company, we're not we're not required to follow any you know commercial time. Yeah, we don't have to fill window. a forty four minute block. Exactly. So you know if if the content the show the show's length is dictated by the content, we shoot for about an hour, figuring that's a pretty good amount of content uh, once a week. And uh, if it goes longer, then you know usually we had just had a bigger week, and if it goes shorter, we just had a shorter week, and it's just it's just a natural result of whatever the topic uh, allows for. So uh, that's kind of my approach. I, I prefer that because I think it keeps the quality and integrity of the show higher. Um, but I, I, I actually really am uh, I'm thankful for people saying they really like the news segment because uh, mm -hmm. one of the things in the last you know two or three seasons really, um, I, I've really really tried to um, improve. The quality of the news, the discourse of the news, and the you know the subreddit has been amazing. And Alan, mm -hmm. you always find a few great stories that we put in there, and all it's all it's all gotten really good. I want to keep it. I want to keep it as high quality as possible, and keep right. it as unbiased and you know as, as as informational as we can. That's why I was kind of butthurt that we got that that infographics job thing in there because it doesn't really kind yeah. of fit with my whole mandate to try to to try to accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish with the news. But yeah, um, um, one thing I would like some feedback from the community on is whether you want. Uh, to cover some of the political stuff or not, like uh, things like patent issues and the uh, some of the copyright stuff, um, mm. we've kind of been covering that a little bit of both right now. And as the as the Linux community, are you guys really interested in the patent stuff that's going on and the tech policy, tech, tech policy type stuff and political stuff? Yeah. Or are you not? Especially wow, look at the chat room. The chat room is unanimously saying yes. I did not expect well, yes, that at but all. Some of, some of the patent stuff is kind of... Or, US well, not so much, yeah, sorry, the, the legal stuff, a lot of it is U.S. specific. And as not being American myself, I sometimes find that annoying. Well, that's uh, a, actually, that would be, I guess, a great... You are a good measure then, in a sense. Uh, well, Because to me, I kind of lose perspective, I think. You know, yeah, like, to me, but, SOPA is a really big deal. But, but honestly, to you, it's just kind of like a what the hell are they doing kind of deal, right? Well, honestly, most Canadians follow American politics more than they follow Canadian politics. <laughs> uh, like, uh, one of the great measures of that was um, the, the old TV show, The West Wing, with yeah. Mark Jean, uh had better ratings in Canada than the U.S. Yeah, you know, uh, I have family in, in very northern Canada, and uh, we went up there uh, a couple of years ago, and it was just question after question. What do you think about this? I mean, very minutiae detail. It, you, you were absolutely right. It was kind of funny. Um, so, uh, yeah, the chat room's pretty positive. I'll, we'll see, too, what the uh, download audience thinks about it, and yep. we might start working some of them, because there is some areas there that uh, we don't really mess with much on the show, and yep. um, we could kick them around, for sure, if people are interested in that. Uh, if, if We had a whole uh, long uh, thing about uh, SOPA on the last episode of TechSnap, and a couple episodes before that, I think it was 33? I forget. Uh, it's one of the episodes I didn't put on the company webpage, because it was me ranting about how the government should make certain things not legal. <laughs> uh, you thought, oh, maybe I don't want clients to see that one. <laughs> well, specifically when we're selling a, a copy protection system for uh, pay-per-view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, good call, man. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know. Any other, any other areas you want to uh, touch, touch on? I think uh, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. There was a, I've tried to consolidate a few different comments into some more general ones that I think kind of yep. what they were trying to get to. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But I we're very open it. to your feedback, yeah. and that's what makes the show. So if you send us the better feedback you send us, the better show you get out of it. So uh, we'll probably let's end let's end the feedback in errata there. Uh, stay tuned though for the next segment because uh, we have information about the uh, last shooting schedule for the rest of the year. So yep. uh, thanks to everyone for uh, joining those discussion threads and sending in your ideas and, and feedback. We'll do this again in another ten episodes. So uh, look forward to it. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Now, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Alan, another great show. Thank you, sir. And uh, now, we do have a little warning. Prepare yourselves. Swallow if you have something in your mouth. Sit down. Take a deep breath, because the Linux Action Show is taking the next two weeks off. Yeah. It's just how the calendar lines up. It, it's Christmas and New Year's, which are yeah. holidays. Yep. Yeah. And the next two Sundays fall on Christmas and New Year's. So we will be taking those two weeks off recharging but that gives you time to fill out that help desk thread if you have questions you want to get yes. on the show so do that and also if you haven't uh, bought all of your holiday gifts yet we do have some affiliate links in the show notes for like think geek and amazon and if uh, you use those links before you shop a portion of your total purchase goes to support jupiter broadcasting so thank you for doing that mm -hmm. alan is there anything else we want to cover before we get out of here 
Um, we got the links. We got. The, we're going to be offered. There will be a text snap. So the chat room is asking, will there be a text yes, snap? Uh, yeah. So there will be text snap uh, on Thursday because mm-hmm. uh, that's mm-hmm. before Christmas. Yeah. And the week after that, it'll actually be the Wednesday. It'll be early. Right. Right. Uh, because I have tickets to go see a show on the Thursday. You know, um, since the Linux Action Show is going to be off for a couple of weeks, and if you haven't gone out and checked out TechSnap, that would be a good time to do it. Alan, yep. do you remember which episodes it was where we covered your ZFS server build? It was like episode uh, 33 and something something else. Yeah. That is a great series. There's also the Ultimate Home Server series if you uh, want to watch three or four a batch of three or four episodes where we talk about yes, building home servers. Yes, those are really good because uh, we cover um, not just... Uh, when we covered it on TechSnap, we covered all the platforms. Uh-huh. So it's like, if you want to build the ultimate home file server, here's how you do it on Linux. For, here's what you yeah. do for Windows and yeah. Mac and so on. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we did firewalls. Uh, we did a whole thing on just RAID and some of the software solutions for RAID as well, like uh, uh, logical volume pools or whatever they're called. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I also really like that doing? episode we did on PFSense in, during that series. Yeah, we, had we a, did a whole thing on firewalls and PFSense. And backups. Uh, we did a great backups, one on backups. Yes, Bacula and Backup My PC yeah. and uh, yeah. even just using rsync and where that's good and where that's bad and so on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, go check out. That's TechSnap. That's our show. That's our other show, TechSnap, that we do here yeah. on the network. And uh, that's a great series to catch up on while we're taking the two weeks off because I know yeah. you guys that like the Linux Action Show will like that show. It is a good show with lots of geeky stuff in it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if you uh, maybe want to learn a little and you uh, feel like sometimes it goes over your head, all you have to do is just press your face up against the monitor and then osmosis takes care of the rest. <laughs> so it's great. <laughs> all right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. And, you know, uh, wait, before I go, I'll tell you the date. So uh, our next live show will be in January 2012, if you can believe that, on uh, Sunday, January 8th, 2012. That'll be the next. Uh, that'll be the next live show and, and that's next release. Ten a.m. Pacific, one p.m. Eastern. Yep. And that, so that'll be. Uh, wow. In two, we'll be back in 2012 on the eighth. That is just. Yep. That's really incredible. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, and we'll see you right back here on the eighth. All right, Linux Action Show wrapper. Here we go. Ba bum ba bum ba. News. <laughs>